Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Centers for Culture and History in Orleans, or as we like to call it, the CHO. Uh, I'm Jay Stradell, and this is my lovely wife, Anne. And uh, I'm privileged to serve as board chair of the CHO, and as such, would like to welcome you all and uh, just tell you a little bit about uh, what led up to all of this. As you may know, uh, this is only the third event we've had live since reopening. Uh, we reopened two weeks ago after the pandemic when uh, the all indications were it was safe enough to do so. And it's so great to have a live audience again and have people back in, in the building. Um, you know, during the pandemic, we worked pretty hard um, in this building and in the Heard Chapel across the way. Uh, between the two buildings, we probably put in pretty close to a million dollars, maybe a little bit more over the last two years. Uh, a lot of the money that went into this building, um, you don't see. It's in the walls, it's under the floor. Um, you may notice a new uh, bathroom that's uh, uh, ADA compliant around the corner. We also have a lift that goes up to the balcony, which we didn't have before. So a lot of improvements to this building. Um, but, you know, inherently it was structural, structurally safe. It was built in 1834, and for that age of building, it's, it's really in great condition. Uh, the Heard Chapel, we're not quite finished with yet. Um, remember that building sat a little bit further down the hill here, and right smack dab in front of this building. And uh, it was used for storage and not very, very well used because of that. It had no heat or very little electricity, so we have been spending a fair amount of money, all of which were raised by federal, state, and local grants, as well as uh, private uh, donations and people, friends like you, uh, made this all possible so that we can make that into a year-round year building and uh, have another space for community use as well as our own. So it, it, it's been a lot of work. Uh, it was tough being closed because even though we were pretty successful in getting grants, uh, not quite so successful in bringing in operating revenue. So, um, you know, I would make an appeal to you if you feel so motivated, if you enjoy the program tonight, there is a donation box at the back of the room. If you would like to donate, we would uh, very much appreciate that so we can keep these programs going. The other thing I just wanted to say quickly is that the reason we did all of this was not just for our own events, but because we are what we call the Centers for Culture and History in Orleans, this is available to anybody. So if you know of a nonprofit organization or perhaps are part of one uh, and you need a place to meet, or if your family is considering a private event like a, a memorial dinner or uh, reception or even a small wedding, come talk to us because this, these buildings are available to the community and we would certainly like to be able to host your events if, if you'd like to do that. So we certainly appreciate the support you all have uh, given us in the past and hope we continue to have your support as we move forward. So without further ado, um, I'd like to turn it over to my wife Anne who um, is by no means an expert historian, but uh, she has done an awful lot of research. She is uh, responsible for many of the parts of the exhibit that are surrounding us, which uh, really covers the founding of the Outer Cape around 1644. Um, as you'll hear, the Hopkins family was not one of the original seven families that founded the Outer Cape, but as we like to say, they got here as quickly as they could. So, so uh, you'll be hearing about that this evening. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to my wife. Thanks, sir. I'd like to share with you tonight a story of some pilgrims who came over to the New World in 1620 on the Mayflower. But unlike some of their fellow passengers, they actually lived to tell about it. Uh, if you'd like more information on this topic, I suggest you might want to check some of my sources of Plymouth Plantation by William Bradford and Mort's Relation. Uh, it's ascribed to uh, William Bradford and Edwin Winslow. Those were both written in the early 1600s. For more contemporary sources, we have um, 
The Mayflower by Nathaniel Philbrick, and A Stranger Among Saints by Jonathan um, Mack, uh, both very, very good books. The passenger list on the Mayflower include, included 50 adult men, 19 adult women, and 33 children. They're portrayed in this graphic on display in the Chose Land called Nosset over there uh, and also over here. Of that number, 51 died that winter of 1620-1621, including half of the crew. These unfortunates are represented as gray ghostly figures in the second graphic from the exhibition. Those who couldn't endure the harsh weather conditions and lack of food fell prey to scurvy and pneumonia. The survivors buried their dead in secret so the Amer Native Americans wouldn't be able to see that their numbers were dwindling, dwindling amazingly. Only two complete family units survived that first winter. The largest is the Stephen Hopkins family. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Unfortunately, I can't show you a picture of what Stephen looks like. Um, there is no definitive picture or portrait. Um, Stephen spelled his name S-T-E-V-E-N in his will. But as it came down in modern times, it's spelled S-T-E-P-H-E-N. Um, they played fast and loose with spelling in those days, and everything was done phonetically. His sag of survival actually begins 11 years before his voyage on the Mayflower. He was born in 1581 in Upper Clotford, Hampshire, England. And he was baptized in this parish church uh, of all saints. When he was five or six, his family moved to Winchester. In that site, there was a Winchester College, in those days quite prestigious. It was thought that perhaps Stephen had gained some formal education at Winchester College. Um, in those days, the literacy rate was pretty shaky. For the upper class children, it was 98%. But if you were in the family of, say, a, far a farmer who was working leased land, like Stephen Hopkins' father was, it was only 21%. So he was very lucky. In, it would later be said that he was a fellow who has much knowledge in the scriptures and could reason well within. He then moved to Hursley, where in 1604, he married his first wife, Mary. They had three children, Constance, Giles, and Elizabeth. The first inkling of Stephen's adventuresome spirit came in 1609. There was a ship leaving to pr provide supplies to Jamestown, Virginia's colonists. And he signed on as a minister's clerk to assist Reverend Richard Buck, um, who took care of all the religious uh, things. And uh, Stephen was actually uh, a second hand. He assisted in ceremonies as well as just being a regular secretary. The Sea Venture was the one that they boarded, the Sea Venture being the flagship of six ships that were carrying supplies to Jamestown. It was heading to Jamestown, but unfortunately, just before it got there, it wrecked. It hit a hurricane, and the Sea Venture was separated from the other five ships, and it crashed on the shore of Bermuda. Most likely, it was during a hurricane, but at any rate, uh, none of the lives were lost, which is great. The passengers and crew survived for 10 months uh, on a very interesting diet of turtles, birds, and wild pigs. When news of the shipwreck reached London, it created quite a stir. One of the 
writers of the day was inspired to write a play, which he called The Tempest. That author happened to be William Shakespeare. It wasn't long in Bermuda before tension began to grow over who exactly had authority over the survivors. Admiral Summers had the final say as far as anything having to do with the ship was concerned because he was the admiral of the fleet. Um, then the governor, Gates, who was there to go on to Jamestown and replace the existing governor uh, in a very uh, flourishing ceremony. Unfortunately, there was no pro uh, problem there. They weren't on the ship anymore, but they weren't in Jamestown either. So who was going to have the last word? Well, it's the sort of thing that you might have talked about to yourself in the corner somewhere, and someone overheard you, or perhaps you mentioned it in conversation. But Stephen had those thoughts and unfortunately was reported to the authorities. They hauled him in, decided that he was guilty of mutiny and, he, and was sentenced to death. He had some people who came to his assistance and vouched for him, and he did a lot of fast talking of his own to take care of himself. He was finally had a sentence committed. He and the other malcontents soon started to construct two boats that would take them to Jamestown. The two were the patience and the deliverance. They were constructed of lumber from the sea venture and also from cedar trees that are native to Bermuda. This, the, uh, yep, the deliverance is one of the ships that came over and it now is in a museum in Somerset, Bermuda, as well as the remains of the sea venture. The shipwreck survivors arrived in Jamestown in May of 1610 to find sheer chaos. It was there later that Stephen learned two very, very important lessons. The first was his encounter with Native Americans. He soon realized the value in playing nicely with others, especially those who considered the colonists unwanted visitors Powhatan was the ruler of a federation of 30 Algonquin tribes that extended from Jamestown up the coast, up the east coast of America to Maine and included the Wampanoags of Cape Cod. Uh, Powhatan was initially warm to the newcomers, but unfortunately they pushed him too far. In the winter of 1609, to 1610, it was known as the starving time in, Bermuda, in uh, Jamestown. They were holed up in a fort that they'd constructed, fearful of venturing out for fear they'd be massacred by the savages. And they ran out of the animals that they'd kept corralled in the fort. So they started eating the leather from their belts and their shoes. And when that ran out, some of the other settlers who had already died. Um, Powhatan gave them food, knowing their, their situation. But then the settlers turned around and complained that they hadn't given him enough. Uh, it wasn't until 1612 that the fortunes of the settlers improved. One of the survivors of the shipwreck in Bermuda who came over with Stephen Hopkins was a man by the name of John Rolfe. John was familiar with Stephen from past experiences in Bermuda. Uh, Stephen had helped officiate at the marriage of John Rolfe to his first wife, and then unfortunately also officiated at the funeral of that first wife and their newborn baby girl. So at any rate, uh, they, they probably knew one another and, and fairly well. Uh, Rolf had brought tobacco seeds with him and he came, he started to plant and, and the seeds flourished and the next thing we knew, tobacco had become the cash crop of Virginia. In addition, Rolf married 
um, Pocahontas. She was the favorite daughter of Powhatan, and the couple left Jamestown for England in 1616. It's very likely that Stephen was on that same ship, homeward bound. When he got back to England, he discovered that his wife Mary had died in 1613. 16, yes, 1613. Um, so he took another wife. He married Elizabeth Fisher in 1617. They had a daughter, Damaris, in 1618. Then comes time for the Mayflower. When the entourage arrived, it included Stephen, his wife, Elizabeth. The older daughter, Elizabeth, had previously died. But Constance and Giles and Damaris were included, as well as two indentured servants that uh, they brought along. Now, this is the crazy part. There were three pregnant women on board the Mayflower, and they were made of tough stuff. Um, Elizabeth was the only one who actually gave birth on the Mayflower. Can you imagine having a baby in the middle of a, on a rolling boat in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, in the middle of a hundred of your not so closest friends uh, with no medical assistance. But that's exactly what Elizabeth did. They named the little boy Oceanus to commemorate the circumstances of his birth. In a time when infant mortality was really pretty high, Oceanus was a pretty little, a pretty lucky little guy. Uh, it's a tribute to Elizabeth that he survived that first winter as well as the others. When all everybody else around him was starving and wondering where they were going to get the next meal, little Oceanus only had to look as far as his mother for that. The Mayflower arrived first in P Provincetown Harbor. It lay at anchor because the waters right near the shore were too uh, shallow uh, for the ship. The pilgrims realized, here we go, this wasn't Jamestown. And they had agreements with both the London Company and the Plymouth Company that said everything was good if they made it to Jamestown. They weren't there. So then there was a lot of disagreement between them in terms of, well, who's in charge? Well, maybe we'll just go about our own way. Well, maybe we shouldn't. Maybe we should all stick in together and, and make the best of it. Well, Stephen remembered that rigid, top-down um, form of governor, government that he'd encountered in Bermuda and may have well been instrumental in developing the Mayflower Compact, which the 41 adult males on the ship signed in Provincetown Harbor before anybody left the Mayflower. Stephen was only one of a few passengers affluent enough to afford to have servants. He had two, uh, Edward Lester and Edward Doty. In exchange for their passage, Edward and Ed, Edward, and Edward uh, were paid uh, at the end of uh, seven years uh, their passage was uh, was declared null and void. Their uh, debt were null and void. They were the last signers of the Mayflower Contact Compact. Um, why he, they were the last, we don't know. Uh, it's possible that the, they were the youngest of the crew, and therefore, by seniority, were the last. Or maybe they were reluctant to sign and needed a little persuasion. Uh, when they settled in Plymouth, Stephen became active in pilgrim de dealings with Native Americans, due in large part to experiences with Jamestown. Most of the pilgrims knew virtually nothing of the people that they called savages. The Wampanoag tribe associated these uninvited guests with the great uh, dying um, that they had witnessed between 1616 and 1619 when the European explorers came and gave them all sorts of diseases and basically eradicated their people. 
In March of 1621, Samoset, an emissary of the great sachem Massasoit, walked into Plymouth and, much to Pilgrim's amazement, said, welcome English, welcome English. He introduced himself to them. He talked to them in, his, in their native tongue. The problem was Massasoit was feeling the heat from another tribe who was rattling their arrows to make war, and he needed an ally. So he wanted Samoset to check out the new pilgrims to see if they were friend or foe. At the end of the day, Samoset didn't leave. <laughs> it was like, guess who's coming to dinner? Um, usually, you have a meeting, and the meeting ends, and you go home. But it wasn't the way that the Indians operated. And there was a problem then. Well, where do you build him that night? They first thought of maybe going, sending him off to the Mayflower, where he could, he could spend the night. But then Stephen Hopkins offered the use of his house as lodgings for Samoset that night. With the little bit of Algonquin that Stephen Hopkins had learned in uh, Jamestown and the English that Samoset knew, uh, they managed to talk their way through the rest of the night. And by the, the following morning, they had reached an agreement and, an, and had made an alliance. Uh, Stephen was also an ambassador chosen by Governor William Bradford. Uh, he served uh, in various capacities uh, with Native American groups in that region. Stephen and Elizabeth went on to have five children uh, in, in Plymouth. Son Caleb was born in 1624. He became a sailor and went off to Barbados, where he died, unfortunately, in 1651. Deborah was born in 1626 and married in 1640, 1626, married in 1646. Damaris, Damaris was named after the little girl who had come on the Mayflower. She had passed away, and they liked the name, evidently, so they gave the next baby the same name. Um, Damaris was married. Uh, Ruth, who followed her, uh, died sometime in her teens. Elizabeth, another case of being named after a deceased sister, uh, the second Elizabeth, was born in 1632, but she died by 1659. And poor little Oceanus finally died in 1627. According to William Bradford, Stephen and Elizabeth lived in Plymouth for over 20 years. She died sometime before 1644, which is when Stephen made out his will, in which he specified that he wanted to be buried next to his deceased wife. Uh, he named his son Caleb as his executor, along with the military leader, Miles Standish, with Miles Standish being the supervisor of the will, because Caleb at that time was a minor. The will was, um, <clears throat> was uh, witnessed by William Bradford and Miles Standish, which gives you a slight look into just how great the trust and respect between the three men was. Two of Stephen Hopkins' children survived. They went on to make significant contributions to the settlement of the region outside of Plymouth. Constant Hopkins, his daughter, was 14 when she came aboard the Mayflower. She was married in, before 1627 to Nicholas Snow. Nicholas Snow had come over in 1623 on the ship Anne. They were prolific. Um, they had 12 children. Um, Nicholas and Constance were 
among the seven families, excuse me, were among the six, seven families who came to what is now called East Ham and Orleans. At that time, it was called the Nauset Colony and settled in um, basically this area. They divided the plot of land in seven uh, sections, the southernmost section being the one given to Nicholas and Constance. East Ham was um, divided in 1797, and the lower part of East Ham was dedicated to the New Orleans. So technically, Nicholas and Constance were the mother and father of Orleans. Now, uh, William Bradford had said, he was quite amazed uh, that they had done so well. He remarked, Constance is married and has 12 children, all of them living, and one of them married. She eventually had 72 grandchildren. Luckily, pilgrims didn't celebrate Christmas. <laughs> when she died in October of 1677, she was interred in Cove Burial Ground in an unmarked grave, along with Nicholas, who had died the previous year. Her brother, Stephen's oldest son, Giles, uh, volunteered to serve in the Pequot War in 1637, but he wasn't called. In 1639, he married a woman named Catherine Weldon. Also in 1639, um, he decided to move to Yarmouth from Plymouth. And so he and Catherine went there and um, proceeded to have 10 children. They had, uh, had those between 1640 and 1664. In 1644, the seven families, including um, Constance and, and Nicholas, uh, established Nauset. Uh, by 1650, finally Giles followed and uh, again also lived in uh, East Ham, Nauset Colony having been renamed East Ham in 1651. Giles died sometime between 1689 and 1690, and like his sister, was interred in Cove Burial Ground in East Ham. This is a copy of Giles' will, last modified in 1689, in which he leaves the bulk of his estate to his oldest son, Josiah. The adventures of Stephen Hopkins and his ability to adapt through a variety of life-threatening experiences make him really an unsung hero of the Mayflower. Um, from his time in Bermuda, he learned the importance of establishing a government by the governed. And in so doing, uh, in, in influenced the foundation of the Mayflower Compact and eventually the Declaration of Independence. He learned in Jamestown that Native Americans could be peaceful and they could be friendly. Um, problem with the newcomers that they have to establish some sort of respect for them and get rid of their attitude of entitlement. In Plymouth, he brought the attitude that everyone, everyone should roll up their sleeves and work for the common good. Without the presence of Stephen Hopkins, the chances are that the Mayflower story would have turned out entirely differently. I'd just like to add a couple of footnotes, if I may, uh, to Anne's presentation. I think of what's significant for us here in, in this part of the Cape, and particularly Orleans, is the fact that, um, that Stephen Hopkins did have that understanding and relationship with Native Americans. And the, uh, the treaty that he worked out with Samoset and then subsequently with Massasoit there in Plymouth was really the foundation for a long period of peaceful relations 
uh, with the Wampanoags here on Cape. And when it came time in 1644 for the seven families to, uh, to settle here, uh, they had permission from the uh, Plymouth court, but yet they still had to negotiate with the Native Americans for the land, and they did so. And uh, what they bargained for uh, is lost in history, but it was very common in those days to, uh, to bargain with uh, or use as, as uh, money, if you will, uh, knives and uh, cooking, you know, metal cooking pots, that kind of thing that uh, really sustained life. It was not so much weaponry as just life-sustaining um, types of things. So we might guess that those are the kinds of things that were traded for the land. Now, you know, is that fair? Uh, looking at it today, who's to say? But the fact is that the, even though the um, seven families, one of the first things they did when they got to Nauset was to build a meeting house there's a picture of it over here on the wall. Uh, it was sort of a meeting house slash fort um, slash center of government slash church. And um, you'll notice in that picture that the uh, pilgrim men were carrying their muskets to church. And the truth is they could be fined if they didn't carry their muskets to church because nobody knew when an attack might come. The reality is because of the work that Stephen Hopkins and others have done, there was never any attack here on, on Cape Cod. You might have heard about the, um, the Indian Wars, um, the, uh, what is it? Cape Cod. Yeah, um, uh, on the King. south shore of uh, King Philip's Wars, on yeah. the south shore uh, of Boston. Um, but all that fighting and that uh, discord was on the South Shore and never came out to the Cape. So that uh, peace was fairly long lasting and it was fairly significant, obviously, for us today. The other piece I wanted to share with you, this uh, picture that's up on the screen now uh, of Giles Hopkins' will, uh, and there's actually at the end, I know it's hard to read, but there's a section at the, on the bottom of the second page that's a, a little codicil that was added a couple years later this is actually a document that was recently recovered along with a number of other fragments from uh, Joshua Hopkins, <coughs> apparently it was Joshua Hopkins um, uh, records. Uh, it was in a house here on the Cape that was in danger of falling down and what I understand is that uh, the caretaker uh, found these documents in the attic and realized their importance and uh, now they're in possession here at, at the Historical Society. Uh, it's unlikely, well, we're not sure whether this is an original copy of the Hopkins will from 1682. Most likely uh, may not be, but certainly some of the other documents that were found with it and document fragments, these are things like property deeds and so on, are clearly from the early 1700s. So it's really amazing what you can still find today and what may be hiding you know, in attics around town and on the outer part of the Cape. So uh, go take a look if you haven't been up in the attic lately. So anyway, I thought those were a couple of interesting uh, factoids to add. Um, we're, we're prepared to have questions yeah. if anybody has questions. Yes, in the back. Uh, I suspect that it may be from a, uh, a succeeding generation, mm -hmm. because I think the closest Stephen got was Garner. No, uh, Stephen never made oh, it Stephen to Yarmouth. Never, okay. They, they gave him, uh, they granted oh, right. him Stephen, land Plymouth. in Yarmouth with the stipulation that he didn't leave Plymouth, oh, which is kind of... Um, yeah. And the and, book about Stephen Hawking is Stranger Among Saints. Yes. That is um, all the way in the back. Yeah, that's that's a great book. Um, it's the, uh, the, Jonathan Mack. Yes, um, by the the meaning of the of the title, um, Stephen Hopkins was the stranger because 
he was not a separatist. You had separatists and you had um, people who were out for economic gain. You had economic freedom, you had religious freedom. There were two different groups. They were sort of half and half uh, as far as the composition of the Mayflower passengers was concerned. And Stephen was there for economic freedom. Um, but they all got along, so. Yes, and way in the back. Thank you very much, Anna. That was wonderful. Thank very you. Informative and also for you. I have a, a question or a point. Um, I've read a book recently. The name of it eludes me, but I think it has something to do with shipwreck and saving the new world. And it's the story of the shipwreck that you linked at the beginning of the talk and uh, all the details surrounding the accident, occurring the hurricane, suffering <laughs> and discovering the serpents and ghosts and were concerned about their ignorance of what the, the island would do. And as it turns out, it turned out to be a paradise. And they flourished there and they were able to build what you said was a tremendous force of cedar that existed at the time. And the, the details of Stephen Hopkins' association with the other crew members uh, is brought to in, in some clarity and detail. And then the rest of the story brings them to the new world where they were able to save the colony because if they hadn't arrived when they did with the supplies that were limited that they did have some supplies and word from, from the old world that there were going to be more vessels coming to help them, uh, they probably would have dissolved at that point. We all know what a catastrophe that first effort to settle was. But uh, without Stephen Hawkins and the other people who were able to uh, go forward, the name of the book, and I thought you might know, I thought you were going to tell me when I mentioned it, you haven't read it, the shipwreck, I believe it's called The Shipwreck to Save the New World. Yeah, you know, it's, it's worth um, mm. getting a hold of and taking a look at. Uh, okay. I think it's yeah. the, you know, the and, and the if, you, if you Google, just you know, without reading any of the other books, if you just Google Stephen Hopkins, you would be amazed by the amount of information that really is out there. Um, and. I do recall seeing the cover of a book that had the Sea Venture on it, and it probably was dealing with just the sort that's, of thing that's that you're. It does have a very dramatic uh, picture of the wreck, and of course, the, the connection to the Tempest piece to play by Shakespeare. Oh, yeah. Is oh, yeah, wreck. absolutely. A connection. Yeah. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Just uh, to add to that point, I think uh, Ann mentioned it, but the, the concept of. Um, Farm or starve is is very key. Uh, obviously, it was a lesson that was learned by Stephen in Jamestown, but it certainly certainly applied to Plymouth once the Mayflower landed here. That first year was so awful uh, that um, you know the whole intent of Plymouth and founding a colony as it was was the idea of working together. Um, they all lived, worshipped, and worked together in Plymouth and then expanded from there. But everybody had to be a farmer, regardless of what your trade mm -hmm. was prior to the Mayflower voyage. Forget all of that, it didn't matter. If you didn't farm, you weren't gonna live. Um, and that's a hard nut to, to swallow if you're someone who is not used to farming. Uh, but um, you learn pretty quickly. Unlike uh, Jamestown, uh, the composition of the Mayflower passengers was interesting. None of them were aristocrats. They were all basically on a level playing field. So nobody had an attitude. And unlike the ones in Jamestown who were wealthy merchants and thought it was way beneath them to, to work the land and were going to sit there and die as a result. Um, they were much smarter when they got to, uh, on the Mayflower. They were um, much more level-headed and all basically of the, the same ilk as far as class structure was concerned. Yes, ma'am. A couple of weeks ago, um, I attended a talk here, I think it was about encounters with the uh, Native Americans. And I thought that I recalled from that that Governor Prince was credited with forming that 1621 peace uh, compact with the Native Americans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when um, 
It started when uh, Samoset uh, came into Plymouth, introduced himself, uh, talked for a while, and then they wondered where he was going to sleep that night. And Hopkins offered his, his house as lodgings. Unlike the other uh, pilgrims, for whatever reason, maybe it was because of his experiences in Jamestown, he was not of the opinion that Native Americans were savages, because he knew better. Whereas the separatists who out for religious uh, freedom um, were very, very wary. And so they were likely, oh, well, one of the things they did was um, uh, first put up a fort. Now that signals something to the people who are standing behind a tree watching them. They just got there. The first thing they do is they build a fort. Um, and they go around carrying muskets to church, you know, and that sort of thing. It, it speaks to what their attitude might be. Um, but Stephen was much more, more liberal. And uh, he, he went with Edward Winslow, one of the authors of uh, Mort's Relation, uh, at the bequest of William Bradford, he went to speak with Massasoit. When any of the Wampanoags had come to Plymouth, the pilgrims insisted that they leave their weapons outside the perimeter of the, bil of the village. When uh, Stephen Hopkins and Edward Winslow went to visit the Native Americans, Stephen made a point of leaving his weapons outside the confines of the uh, settlement of the Native Americans. So it was tit for tat. Um, if it's good for you, it's good for me too. So that kind of an understanding goes way beyond what the mentality was at that, at that time. Yes. Yes, it actually is a descendant of that original the original uh, church original meeting house meeting house. Yeah. The other thing is um, there's a book and I can't remember the title by Nickerson from the 1960s where he compiled a lot of articles and material and he said that um, the Indians were really pushed down to around Aries Pond <coughs> by 1640. Do you have any idea how that? Um, the, the Indians, the Native Americans, right. were not moved until 1660 uh, from this part of Cape Cod. Um, everybody was happy. They, they had given, um, made sure that when they did their developing, uh, that the settlers wouldn't infringe on, for instance, the corn growing area that's now on Nauset Heights. Um, that was the Native Americans, and it stayed the Native Americans, no problem. Um, they didn't get into any sort of a hassle and decide that it was time that they needed more land until 1660, when the Reverend Bourne uh, came uh, and decided Let's all put them in a nice home where they'll all be happy. And thus we found Mashpee. And they stayed in Mashpee. And they didn't bother the settlers anymore. I think what was also interesting <clears throat> is the, the philosophy of land ownership, or mm -hmm. the understanding of land ownership at that time. Clearly, the Europeans saw land as something to own, to possess, and you bought it and you sold it. The Native American perspective was that they were caretakers of the land, so they didn't really ever own it, and it wasn't theirs to buy or sell. So there's clearly a different philosophy at work here, and you know how that interacted with, as I said earlier, the negotiations of the 1644 settlers here on the Outer Cape with the Native Americans 
uh, that may have come into play and the Native Americans didn't really realize what the settlers meant by buying and buying land. But nonetheless, the point is that the settlements took place, there was no animosity, mm -hmm. uh, and everybody got along uh, until at least until the time that Anne talked about. So the early part of that, there was very much respect. Uh, and it was very clear that in the Plymouth Court uh, and that agreement for the original settlements out here, that land was to be reserved for the Native Americans, particularly at Nauset Heights, because that had been their growing area for centuries. Okay. Yes, Bill. I'm not sure they were forced at that time, Bill, no, no. though, were they? No, they didn't live there so much as that where right. they were encouraged to worship. Right. One of the things about this time of history, as you all know, is that, you know, there's so many different interpretations over the years, and it's hard to tell, you know, who's right and who isn't. And so, you know, you're, you're open to your own interpretation of the facts, and nobody is still around, obviously, that was there at the time. And except for Bradford and, um, and Winslow, there were very few uh, writings from the 1600s of anybody who was directly involved in those events. So, you know, details are a little sketchy, <laughs> to say the least. But it's fun, yeah, to, fun Todd, to pursue it. Todd Pellick, who's the historian at Nickerson, is a great resource. And he mentions two to him I think are Good to know. The other interesting piece you spoke about the Federated Church it was only after the demise of the first preacher was the second uh, church allowed to exist. So when, uh, and I don't recall his name, but until he passed away, there could only be one meeting house, one area. Was that rubber treat? Yes. Thank you. Any other questions or any other knowledge to share? I mean, we're learning just as much as you all are, so this, this is fun. Okay. Well, thank you all very much for coming. And uh, just a reminder that we've got uh, coming up on July 22nd is our next uh, I'll give a little plug for that. Now, okay, go ahead, Bill. <laughs> um, what I want all of you and invite all of your friends and neighbors to do is come and understand as much about what we know about the people and their history as about what the material culture tells us about the place. So come with an open mind, and we will take you on a trip. <laughs> Just by the way, Bill Weeble is another uh, member of our board and is responsible for a lot of the actual artifacts that are over in that ex exhibition. I left between the question and the answer. So there he goes. <laughs> there he goes. So, so that's on uh, July 22nd at uh, 7 p.m. And we also have an open mic uh, evening with uh, music and entertainment coming up on July 17th. And, uh, You'll be hearing more from that if you're on our email list. If you're not, please sign our register, and we'll be happy to put you on the list. So thank you all very much. Thank you. We hope you enjoy this program. There are a number of ways you can continue to help us provide more programming and more experiences for the community. Here are several ways to do that. You can donate. You can get involved. You can volunteer. But we look forward to your support. Thank you very much, and see you soon.